Welcome to Sealing God's People with your host, Dennis Beard, talking about the present truth and the season of the Word of God. What season are we in? And what and why does it make any difference? What is the meaning of it? We see that in Leviticus 23, we have the Feast of the Lord. Now, there's seven Feasts of the Lord, three specific seasons in the Old Testament that they were, Israel was required, commanded of the Lord, to go to the place where God had placed his name three times a year. That were, as uh, stated in the Word of God, the three seasons that they were required to go to the place where God had placed his name there, Jerusalem. The feast of uh, Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits make up the first season, which is the feast uh, the season of, of Passover. Then we go to the second season. It has only one feast, the Feast of Weeks, which we call the Feast of Pentecost. And the reason for that is that after first fruits, you are number seven Sabbaths, seven sevens, and on the morrow. Pentecost being 50 days from first fruits of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then we go to the final season. It has another three feasts. Those last three feasts are the Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, Feast of Tabernacles. Now we see this in Leviticus 23. These feasts are in the Hebrew Moed, or divine appointments of God with man. We find in Leviticus 23 the seven feasts, and it talks about that they are high holy days, special Sabbaths. Now, what does that mean for us? When we see that many want to keep a Sabbath day today, saying that you must keep that Sabbath or the last day of the week, that if you don't, that you have broken the law. But we see a very important scripture given by Paul, who, if anyone knew the law, Paul Saul of Tarsus studied under Gamaliel. And if anyone knew the law, Paul, the apostle, knew the Lord and the law of Moses. There later on called to preach the gospel on the Damascus Road and then understood that the law of Moses was fulfilled and that had brought it to a higher state of glory being the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, which must be obeyed unto righteousness and unto holiness. And he states that in Romans 5, whosoever you yield your members of service, obey him, but the service to whom you obey. We all understand that. Whether sin unto death, which would be iniquity, lawlessness, you're not being, obeying the leading of the Holy Ghost, or of obedience unto righteousness. Now, righteousness is progressive because we go from faith to faith, from glory to glory. If it was just one belief, there would not be a growing in grace. You couldn't grow in grace. It would be, well, you're saved, that's it. Once saved, always saved, and there would be no growth process at all. But there is a growth. We go from faith to faith, from glory to glory, even by the Spirit of the Lord. We see that many times in the Word of God. It's progressive. And that is why that John states, if we walk in the light, and that requires obedience to walk, if we walk in the light as he is in the light. Now, who's in the light? Well, the man Christ Jesus, who wrought salvation for us in the days of his flesh, was the Father revealed in a body of flesh and blood, Emmanuel, God with us. And we see that in 1 Timothy 6, 15 and 16, that Jesus Christ, the blessed and only potentate. That's the omnipotent. That's the almighty God. That is in 1 Timothy 6, 15 and 16, that there's not an almighty God junior. He's not a second person of the Godhead. It states that Jesus Christ is that omnipotent almighty God. Well, some will say, well, that just refers to the spirit that he is and not the body of flesh and blood, and separate the man 
from the Spirit. But as we look further on in the Scripture, Paul talking, they're telling us in Timothy, that's 6, 15 and 16, the verses 15 and 16, that Jesus Christ, the blessed and only potentate, capital P, the Almighty, which is the Spirit of God, and in whom, that is in Christ Jesus, the man uh, dwelleth what dwelleth life, dwelleth immortality, dwelleth eternal life, that all life should be in the man, Christ Jesus. So he's the blessed and only potentate who only hath immortality. Somebody said, well, I have immortality, and I'm not God. No, we are partaker of the divine nature, but we are not the divine nature. Jesus is. He is that only nature of God. That's the meaning of the only begotten Son of God, the only begotten God, the only begotten one. Means that he has the same nature as God. There's not a dual nature in Christ. Yes, he was in the flesh. Yes, but he did not have the nature of Adam. Otherwise, he would have to be saved. He would have to be baptized for his sins. He was the only sinless man ever born ever in the end of this world. The spotless, blameless Lamb of God. He did not get baptized of John and Jordan in Beth Arba, where John the Baptist was baptizing, to wash away his sins. When he comes to John the Baptist, he says, baptize me. John the Baptist is just flabbergasted. He said, I have need to be baptized of you, whose shoe latches I'm not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I know who you are. Jesus said, suffer it to be so. Not to wash away his sins? No. That'd be totally against the scripture that he is the holy, blameless, sinless man ever born. That is why he's the seed of the woman. That's the reason why for the virgin birth. He's not of the seed of Adam being the Adamic nature. He would have to have a savior. But by the seed of the woman, well, there... There's no sin nature in him, even though he's in flesh and blood, just like you and just like me, that will be tempted at all points like as we are, yet without sin, Hebrews 4.15. So it tells us that John said that we are to walk in the light as he is in the light. That's 1 Timothy 6.15 and 16. That Jesus Christ, a blessed and only potentate, who only hath immortality, what? Dwelling in the light. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, nor see, nor can see. The man Christ Jesus entered into that light. He is the divine nature of God that was manifest in a body of flesh and blood, not the second person of the Godhead. That is a lie. Somebody said, well, there the Father being one person, the Son being another person, and the Holy Ghost being another person is the same as saying that Jesus is God. No, emphatically not, because Jesus states in John 8, 24, when asked, where is your Father by the Pharisees? Jesus states, except you believe that I am he, the Father, you shall die in your sins. That is a, certainly an essential for salvation in the revelation of Jesus Christ, that after you're a newborn babe, you must grow, and that next state from a newborn baby is little children. The little children, their sins are forgiven for their name, for the Lord, his name's sake, but also, it says that I write to you, little children, because you've known the Father. That's in John's epistle, 1 John 2, 12 to 14. So it is a requisite that we know in Revelation that Jesus is the Father. The man is the Father revealed. Jesus states that over and over again. John 8, 24, except you believe that I am he, 
he shall die in your sins. This they understood not that he spake to them of the Father, John 8, 27. They don't understand it today. John 14, Jesus stated, stated there, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house of many mansions, were not so I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest. How can we know the way? Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father, not me, the Father, but by me. From henceforth you both know him and have seen him. Now, when did they see him? Well, Philip is confounded. He's a little... Uh, uh, in the dark there, he doesn't understand. He's a little confused, and he asks the question that we all ask. Lord, show us the Father, and that suffices us. That'll be sufficient. Let us have uh, that revelation of the Father. Let us see the Father. We know who you are. We can see you. You're the Son of God. But now we want to know very specifically, where is the Father? Jesus responds, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? What? Known me? Philip should have known already that he is the Father. And how sayest thou then? Show us the Father. Believe me that I am in my Father, my Father in me, or else believe me for the work's sake. What works? Well, he healed the sick, cleansed the leper, raised the dead, cast out the devils, opened blind eyes, loose the dumb tongue, the lame walked, and the captive went free. Blessed is he whom so is not offended in me, not in us, in me. And Jesus stated, the words that I speak, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. Now that dwelleth is a Greek word, katechaos, which means to house permanently, a permanent abode to abide there forever without end. The Father that dwelleth in me, houses permanently in me, manifests permanently forever in me. He's the one doing the works. Now that's very explicit. Can't miss that. And Jesus would say in John 10, 30, I and my Father are one. We're one in the same spirit. And that is exactly what is revealed in the revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. He sent and signified it by his angel unto John. What was that? What's the revelation? What's the basic, found fundamental revelation of Jesus? Well, right there in Revelation 1.8, it's given to us. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending, which is, was, and is to come, the Almighty, Revelation 1.8. But we have not been taught that through these ecumenical councils and synods of centuries ago, saying that that was a foundational belief of the church of a trinity God, three persons in one Godhead. No, that was not in the beginning. It came about in 325 A.D., in the Council of Nicaea, the Nicene Creed, stating there in the days of Constantine, the emperor of Rome, that he had all the bishops and cardinals come together and state that whatever they come up with in their revelation, that we today, centuries later, must believe or we're a heretic. What? We're a heretic because we would believe what a bunch of men got together and their own understanding of the word back then. And it's been progressive ever since then, but the, the apostles never preached a Trinity God. The prophets never preached a Trinity God. In the Torah, there was never a Trinity God. Matter of fact, quite the opposite, quite the contrary. It was always the Holy One of Israel. Even the Shema. Deuteronomy 6, 4. And that, before they go to bed, when they rise up all throughout the day, before the, the uh, morning sacrifice, before the evening sacrifice, they always blew the trumpet, the, sh 
stating the Shama here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, not a trinity, one. Now you'll have some that say, well, now, here, O Israel, here, O Israel the Lord our God is one Lord, and one there is the God. Not Yaqid, Yikad, which means a plurality of one. No, it doesn't. One means one. Well, they would have us to believe one means three. <laughs> if you ask a child, two to three, four years old, how many fingers are one? Are there two? Are there three? They'll say no. The child will say there's one. He'll hold up one finger. Well, that's how simple a gospel is. The greatest commandment of all, Mark 12, 29. When the scribe asked Jesus, what's the first dominant commandment? What's the first commandment of all? Jesus replied, Mark 12, 29. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt serve the Lord with all thy heart, soul, and might. The second is likened to it, to love thy neighbor as thyself. From all this hang all the law and the prophets. That's the fundamental foundational rock of the church, the foundation, which is Christ which is the Spirit of God, as we see in 1 Peter 1, verse 10 and 11. All the Old Testament prophets. That's from Moses, Samuel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, all the way to Malachi. Search diligently into the grace that should come unto us, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ uh, that was in them. They prophesied by the Spirit of Christ. Christ is that Spirit. Always has been God and always will be God. Well, somebody say, well, the man Christ Jesus was created. Therefore, he can't be God. God formed himself a body of flesh and blood to redeem us that were under the law. He came in under the law in the body of his flesh to redeem us. Now, why would God do that? Well, because a man lost it. Only a man can redeem us back. We have to have a kinsman redeemer. A kinsman redeemer is one like us. Hebrews 2, for as much then as the children are protectors of flesh and blood, he, that is God himself, likewise took part of the same, that in all things he was made like unto his brethren. Hebrews 4, 15, he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. He is our kinsman redeemer. He's one of us. He's not an Adam before the fall. He was an Adam after the fall, receiving uh, that body of flesh and blood from Mary. And uh, there, in with the word of God, that Mary has a visitation of Gabriel and said, you're going to bear a son. And he will be, be called the son of the highest. And thou shalt call his name Jesus, G Jehovah, Sus, is salvation. His very name is Jehovah, is salvation. Not Jehovah Jr., not God Jr., Jehovah Jr. So it behooves us to have the revelation of Jesus. How is this have the work? How is the mechanics? What is this revelation? And that's what is given to us by the apostles, the apostles' doctrine. Jesus stated that he and the Father were one and one of the same spirit, not a different spirit, not a second person, but one of the very same spirit. John 10, 30 states that. John 8, 24 states it again. And my, my Father are one, except you believe that I am he, the Father, you shall die in your sin. Then he states it again, John 14. Then in John 16, he said, I will no more speak in Proverbs, but I'll show you plainly of the Father. Why? Because the Father that is, the revelation of Christ, the revelation of God was hid. It's only revealed to those that seek God with a pure heart, diligently seeking Him. You'll see it in Colossians 2, verse 1 through 9. Now, that's what God's doing now to get the people that really, truly believe in the Lord Jesus Christ to move from a false doctrine into the true doctrine of Christ. Now, in most anomalous churches, Christ has never been taught. It's not the individual believer's fault. It's the minister's fault. They should have sought out of the word of God, 
Seek in God, because if you seek him, you'll find him. Ask him to be given you. Not going to be open to you. In the day that you search for God with all your heart, the day that you will find him, seek him diligently. And he that come to God must believe that he is, that he is God, and a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Diligently. But must go to a seminary and there believe whatever is told them. And they don't read the whole word of God. They don't have time to do that. That'd be ridiculous. We'll take out of the word of God and we'll rightly divide it, chop it up, and then throw out what we don't like and then believe what we do. We've been brainwashed. Somebody said, how dare you? Well, the doctrine of divinity, a PhD in theology. He's a good man. He went to seminary. He's got a doctor's degree. He's got a PhD in theology. How dare you? Well, read the Word of God. When you read the Word of God, on your own. You don't have to have uh, an IQ there higher than anybody else. Simply just seek God. He made you. And he said, you seek me with all your heart. You will find the truth. And if you continue in my word, not just read it one time and get a one verse, Charlie. You know, most people quote John 3, 16, and that's all they know. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, and whosoever believed in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. True. But there's much more than one verse. If you continue in my word, God said, then you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. That True requires us to continue in the word, not just a little born babies or little children. We have to grow up, but very few people think we have to grow up in a progressive uh, revelation of Jesus Christ from faith to faith, from glory to glory. That's the problem. And we're in the last season of God in the last days. And more and more seducers, and evil men and seducers are waxing worse and worse. And this devil, the man who sent the son of perdition, deceives the whole world. We know that in Scripture. Then how do we know that we're not going to be deceived? Well, we simply add to our faith virtue. Virtue, knowledge. My people perish for lack of knowledge. You get the knowledge of God. And, and then add to knowledge uh, temperance. Temperance is self-control. Those that strive for the mastery must be temperate, self-controlled in all things, in all things of truth. And then temperance, then we add patience. That after we've done the will of God, we have need of patience that we receive a full reward. But tribulation works patience. We're not only called to believe on Jesus, but also to suffer with him. You don't find that preached very often. That 1 Peter 4, 1, for as much then Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, be you therefore likewise minded. Arm yourselves with the same mind. That's the mind of Christ. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. What if you don't suffer in the flesh? If you don't suffer with him, you won't reign with him. Well, thank God and a joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Though your faith be tried as by fire, that it can come forth as pure gold to the glory of God. Trouble on every side but not in distress, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed, always bearing about in our bodies the dying of the Lord Jesus. Now, there is a new one for the prosperity church. <laughs> for we which live are always delivered unto death. Somebody said, well, I thought we was always delivered unto money. For mammon, have a house on the hill, cars, lands, great uh, financial portfolios, mutual funds, stocks, bonds, and have uh, increased it with goods and have need of nothing. We're like Laodicea in church. We're increased with goods. We're blessed. We follow God. <laughs> uh, forgive me. It's ludicrous. No one has read the word of God from cover to cover to seek God diligently with their whole heart. Many years ago, while preaching, been in this thing almost 50 years as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But while on the evangelistic field, I would simply 
when taking the pulpit, turned over to me in a service, I would ask the question, everyone that's read the Bible through from Genesis to Revelation, please lift up your hands. <laughs> Bad mistake. And sometimes maybe only one out of a congregation of five or 600 would raise their hand. Why? Very, very few. Sometimes not even the pastor. And you get to wondering, well, if we haven't read the Word of God and hadn't sought God, then where do we get called to preach? Well, we went through a seminary. Or we went through what a denominal church told us. And these are the scriptures that we hold to. And if you're a good little pastor, then we will let you have a church in our denomination. But if you get out of that, we're going to call you on uh, the ecumenical councils and the board, and we're going to reprimand you because you have read too much in the Word of God. You have to stay within the boundaries of what the denominal creed is, and that is pretty much what every denominal church has done in the world. As long as you go through their seminaries and cookie cutters, then that's what you preach. Somebody said, how dare you? That's blasphemy. No, blasphemy is blaspheming the Holy Ghost and taking the power of God and attributing it to Satan. But it's certainly not people that have gone through some kind of cookie cutter seminary that literally kill their faith and then they're given a position in a church and as long as they preach within those denominal guidelines according to their doctrinal statement, then they'll be okay. And if they don't, and they get revelation, then there's going to be problems. And that's where the true body of Christ comes in. Those that read the word of God, that grow up in heaven in all things, are going to be hated of all nations for the name of Jesus. They'll do everything they can to destroy and cleave to you with flatteries, and by peace shall destroy many. And they will have indignation against the Holy Covenant, the Holy Covenant of Jesus. They will hate you because they hated Jesus. Jesus said that they've hated me first. If they hated me, they'll hate you. If they call the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call you Beelzebub? Well, somebody said, well, I don't want, I don't want to fight that fight of faith. I don't want to battle that. I don't have time. I've got to make money. We're talking about your eternal soul here. We're talking about eternity. We're not talking about buying a house for 30 years and whether or not it's going to be a good buy or not. Inflation taking it over and we have to uh, suffer a loss in, in a, a wrong decision. We're talking about your eternal soul forever and ever and ever. So it behoove us to seek God for ourselves because anyone, any believer that does not Find the will of God for their individual life. According to the purpose and will of God for them individually, will not make heaven. They can go to their church, pay their tithes, be a good person in the community, never hurt anybody, and even give their body to be burned. So much of sacrifice. Understand all mysteries. Have faith to move mountains. But if they have not charity, they're a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Why would that be? Because charity is the final growth rate to the fullness of the measure of the statue of Jesus. It's not a newborn baby. It's not little children. It's not even young men growing up in the Lord Jesus. But it is charity growing up full-grown fathers. And that's what is in this season of tabernacles. Now we find in Colossians 2, the second chapter, reading from the Word of God, and it says uh, that Jesus blotted out the handwriting. This is Colossians 2, verse 14. Jesus blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. That's a cross that he took the ordinances of that cross and nailed it that ordinances of that, of that law, and nailed it to his cross, and thereby broke down that middle wall of partition, part of God from man, and he did it in his own body of flesh and blood, God manifest in the flesh. 
So blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that were against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Well, thank God. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly. What? Triumphing over them in it. What is it? The first descended. He first descended to the heart of the earth, and he literally had a show of uh, a showdown, really, uh, that he literally triumphed over Satan and stomped him, taking the keys of death, hell, and the grave. Of grave, where is thy sting? Of death, where is thy sting? Grave, where is thy victory? Swallowed up in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, notice it says, Therefore, let no man therefore judge you in meat. Well, wait a minute. We can't, we can't eat uh, this because that's swine. It's unlawful to eat. And that's the uh, dietary code in the Old Testament. That's the dietary law, so we can't do that. But what God has called clean, call not thou common. We find that with Peter. Arise and eat, Peter said, not so. None of these I have eaten from my youth up. Well, let no man judge you in that meat. In what? Or in drink. Can we just uh, drink booze and, and think, well, that's okay, because no, even though we're drunk, we'll still make heaven. No drunkard shall inherit the kingdom of God. That's excess. But it there, in a drink there, that in judging meat or drink, where we, we are judged by that under the law. Then he goes on and says, why? Because he has taken the ordinances of that law that we were bound under, which no flesh could keep it by the weakness of the flesh, God sending on his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. But what does it mean to us now? Well, let no man judge you in meat or drink or in respect of a holy day. Well, the holy day we're talking about, we have to keep the Passover and the dead first fruits, the Feast of Pentecost, there, the Rosh Hashanah, the, the Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, Feast of Tabernacles. Well, what do these have to do with us? What were they given? They're Moed, divine appointments of God with man, and with God lets us see his calendar of what his work of that is going to be for us in that last day work of the ministry when judgment slay to the line and righteousness to the plummet that he arises to his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. That's the reason many will never know, and it will take them unawares, and it surprises the hypocrite because they never knew it. They didn't seek God. He goes on and says, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days. Of the Sabbath. And we're told by many that the sign of the seal in the last days is simply keeping the Sabbath. That's not what Paul said to the church at Colossia. That's exactly opposite. He's letting a man judge in that. So you're saying, well, that, that day is above every day. And there's four, if you don't keep that Sabbath day, that Saturday, that you have literally broken the law and you will be condemned by it. You will not be sealed. In Revelation 7, the apocalyptic signaling of the servants of God in their forehead because you broke the Sabbath. <laughs> no. Why? He goes on and explains why. Let no man judge it. And meat, drink, respect of a holy day of a new moon or the Sabbath day. Verse 17, Colossians 2, verse 17, which are a shadow of things to come. That's the spirit of prophecy. That's the testimony of Jesus. That's Revelation 19, 10. Things are now faith, not yesterday's faith, not tomorrow's faith. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. There's your things. The evidence of things not seen. The things seen are temporal. The things which are not seen are eternal. And the revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave unto him is to show unto his servants, the true servants of God, things which must shortly come to pass, signified by his angel and John. 
And that sign, signet, is a sign of life taught, which is the seal, which is the word of God in present truth and the preceding word of God by which we all live by. And he says, they are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. What does that mean? Well, the body. In Revelation 19.10, that is not an angel. It's the body of Christ. The body is of Christ. And it's the spirit of prophecy showing you things that will come to pass. Then we see there in Revelation 19.10, John comes upon this man. And he is sure that it's the Lord Jesus. And if anybody knew the Lord, John, the apostle, John the revelator, knew the Lord Jesus Christ. He was sure that it was the Lord. And you don't worship anything but God. Worship God and him only. And John was about to worship him. He said, see, thou doest it not. Who is this man? Revelation 19.10. Well, the ecumenical churches and the uh, the nominal churches today tells us that that is uh, uh, the very basically angels. Those are angels, but the man is an angel. No, it's not. No, we know it's not because uh, the the self uh, statement made by the man to John is, "See, thou doest and not do not worship me." Why? For I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren. Well, what's the difference? That have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. Don't worship me. You are of uh, the brethren. The brethren, the fellow servants of God, the church of the living God, that have the testimony of Jesus. That's the difference. They have the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy. They know the things that are coming upon the world are being revealed by the Holy Ghost, that it's God manifest to them before that comes to pass, and they're, they are ready for the work of the ministry. They're sealed for that. They have eyes before and behind in the revelation of Jesus. And that's in this last day season that we see that Peter warns us about in Second Peter, the first chapter. Now, what does it mean to us? Well, we're in a new season. God has shifted gears. We have gone from Passover. That was death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Feast of Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of First Fruits that were fulfilled in Christ, our Passover sacrifice for us, and the gospel according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Everyone knows that. Well, then we have the second season with one feast, the Feast of Pentecost. That's number seven weeks or seven times seven, 49. And on the morrow, that would be 50, Pentecost, 50 days after first fruits. They, they were on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, the Acts the second chapter, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, that's the second season. That is the second season coming in uh, there to the body of Christ, the dispensation of grace. They were one mind and one accord. Then there came the sound of a rushing mighty wind. Uh, Twelve and tongues of fire appeared and set on each one of them. They were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. And then they're born of the water and the Spirit. From that point on, given by Peter on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2.37, men and brethren, what must we do? Peter gives the plan of salvation. He was given the keys to the kingdom of heaven in Matthew 16. What does he do? Repent and be baptized. Every one of you, not just repentance. Well, the, the, the nominal church world says you just repent and you're saved. That's a lie. You're not born of the water and the spirit there. You just repent it. Godly sorrow works of repentance unto salvation, not to be repented of. It's going to be many that are not going to make heaven because they never did the will of God, according to Matthew 7, verse 21, 22, because... They called Jesus Lord, Lord, but they did not do the will of God. They didn't find the will of God for their individual lives and therefore were cast out. Jesus stating, I never knew you. Depart from me, you the work of iniquity. Iniquity is lawlessness. Never, were never led of the Spirit of God. Hmm. Well, whose fault is that? It's the ministers. But the believer ultimately 
the responsibilities on each one of us as believers that we must seek out of the book these things uh, that will certainly come to pass. Seek you out of the book and read not one of these things shall fail. Search the scriptures in them. We think we have eternal life. And these are they that Jesus said, testify of me. In the volume of the book is written of me, Jesus said, I come to do thy will, O God, for a body thou hast prepared me. Who's the me? God prepared himself a body. You'll see that in Philippians 2, 6 through 8. You'll see it again in Isaiah 43, 10 through 15. Who is it? You are my witnesses, thus saith the Lord, and my servant, whom I have chosen. The, 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 the nominal world tells us that's the second person of the Godhead with the Father of glory. That's a lie. Well, it seems that way to the natural mind. Yes, well, it seems that way to the natural mind. But that carnal mind is death. He says in Isaiah 43, 43.10, Thus saith the Lord, You are my witnesses, the true witnesses of God. Thus saith the Lord, the Lord Jehovah God Almighty, that invisible spirit of God, the omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent spirit of God, and my servant whom I have chosen that you may know and believe me and understand, I am he. The Lord is that man before me. There was no God for me that shall be after me. What do you see? See now that I'm God, thy Savior, the Lord, thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, Isaiah 43, 15. No Holy Trinity. That's what God's doing now to those that have an ear to hear. Somebody says, well, I'm confused. Well, seek God. He'll lead you. He'll guide you. Somebody said, well, can you help Brother Beard? Well, I'm doing that. We're doing everything we can. We're doing a podcast. We've written seven books, authored seven books that you can pick up at DennisBeard.org, e-books. And some of you are going there, purchasing that. If you have any questions, please let me know. You can email me at SealingGodsPeople at DennisBeard.org. If you have a question, let me know. I'll do everything I can to pop the rack, shine your shoe, and to help you in the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's our job here at Dennis Beard Ministries, DBM. That's our whole calling. We're to pop the rack, shine your shoes. We're servants of the Lord Jesus Christ, not of our righteousness or any of our holiness, but God that has and works in through the body of Christ, edifying one another. Whichever joint supplies to the edification of the body of Christ, edifying of itself in love. And that's our calling, to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So what? how do we know that we're going to be right with God? How do we know this testimony of Jesus, this spirit of prophecy? How do we know these things in Colossians uh, uh, 2 there that he states that these are a shadow of things to come that are ahead of us? That's revealed now in the New Testament. And... Uh, the body is of Christ. He mentions that. Well, why? Because in Revelation 19, 10, John sees this man. And he's about to worship him. See that, see thou doest it not. Worship God. Why? I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. Don't worship me. Worship God. Don't worship the body of Christ. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. They understand those things. Well, we have to see afar off. That's the testimony of Jesus, spirit of prophecy. How do we do that? Well, second place, second Peter, first chapter, through these sincerely great and precious promises given to us that may, we might be partakers of his divine nature and escape the corruption world through lust. We see that in second Peter one, verse four. Let's take it verse five. How can we know that we know that we know without a shadow of a doubt that God will be pleased with us and we'll have entrance into the kingdom of heaven. We just say the Lord's Prayer? No. Or ask Jesus to come into our, our heart? No. Just say the sinner's prayer? No. Then what do we do? Well, we have to be born of the water and the spirit. Do we stop there? No. We go to little children. See that in 1 John 2, 12 through 14 in John's epistle. I write you little children because now you've known the Father. You know that Jesus is the Lord of glory. The Father. Do you stop there? No. You go to young men where the Word of God is strong in you and you've overcome the wicked one. That means you have searched God in His Word, continues His Word, and you've been set free. Stand therefore in the liberty, warning Christ has made you free. Men not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Then what? 
Is that it? No, you go to fathers, full grown. And the fathers there that have known him, that's from the beginning. That's the word of God. They have their eyes opened. They know the things that are coming upon the face of the earth to try the earth. No, earth, earth, earth. Hear ye the word of the Lord. Here it is in 2 Peter 1, verse 5. And beside this, giving all diligence, seeking God diligently now, giving all diligence, add to your faith, don't stop at faith, virtue. Now we're going from faith, hope, to charity. It shows us how to get to charity. And without that charity, in 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, we are sounding brass and a tickling cymbal. We will not make heaven. It rejoices in the truth, bond not itself, now he's puffed up, seeketh not its own. But it rejoices in the truth. But we have to have that truth, and that requires us to seek the Lord God in his word, uh, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. That we may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God for us is. Each individual has a perfect will of God according to the purpose and will of God for each of us. So we work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, knowing it's God that worketh in us both the will and the do of his good pleasure. We must do his will, or we do not have access to the kingdom of heaven, even though we did what the church denominal world said. And in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the constitution of the kingdom of heaven, in Matthew 7, 21, it says, Not all the same to me, Lord, Lord, we'll be able to enter in. What? We don't get to enter in the kingdom of heaven? I was told I would but only those that do the will of God. What? They will profess unto Jesus then, Lord, we have prophesied in thy name. Look at what we've done. And in your name, we've cast out devils. In your name, we've done many wonderful works. Jesus didn't say, no, you didn't. They weren't born again. They just didn't do the will of God. They didn't follow the leading of the Holy Ghost, the Christ in them. They didn't fulfill the calling of God. Jesus said, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Iniquity is lawlessness, not being led of the Spirit of God, not in obedience. So what do we do? We have to go from faith, hope, and charity, the grace of these and charity. And when Paul said, I was a child, it makes a child understood as a child. I was born again. The children know that he's the father, 1 John 2, 12 through 14. But that will not be enough. We have to do the will of God, not just know it. We have to do it. Now, that requires obedience unto righteousness, unto holiness that we see in Romans 6. Obedience is required, regardless of what some pastors would say that have never read the Word of God and by this ecumenical councils and synods that you're saved through a repentance, which is a lie. Now, those that know the truth, you know that you're pressing toward that mark. For the prize of high calling of God in Christ Jesus, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. You have that mind. You have that mind of Christ. And Paul said, we speak wisdom only to them that are perfect, because they're the only ones that will receive it. Realizing we have to go on to the measure, the stature of the fullness of Christ, and to a perfect man, growing up in him in all things and all truth, and not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. That's Ephesians 4. So what do we do? How do we get to charity? We start with faith. But faith alone won't save you. Faith without works is dead. And through obedience unto righteousness, we're going to add to our faith virtue. That's verse 5, 2 Peter 1, verse 5. And to virtue, knowledge. Everyone knows my people perish for lack of knowledge. And to knowledge, temperance. Temperance is self-control. Those that strive for the mastery must be temperate, self-controlled in all things, in all things of faith. And to temperance, patience. Well, patience, tribulation, work with patience. Patience, work with experience. Experience, work with hope. Hope makes us not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in the heart by the Holy Ghost. Yes, but after we've done the will of God, we have need of patience that we will receive a full reward. But let patience have her perfect work. There, that is, we've been tested. And through that test, we get a testimony. So we don't, we count it a joy when we fall into the diverse temptation. We don't get mad at God and walk off. Saying, what are we going through this? Why, God, why? Because these tribulations work patience. Thank it. Count it a joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Oh, your faith be tried as by fire. It can come forth as pure gold. Now that we have pretty much today a crossless Christianity. 
and we don't mortify the deeds of the flesh, crucifying the flesh with the affections of the lust. Those that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections of the lust. And Paul states that, if you're not preached too much, but in 2 Thessalonians, the second chapter, that we are saved through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Not just one verse, and one verse Charlie, through the Word of God, drawing up to Him in all things. So we add to our faith, virtue, virtue, knowledge, knowledge, temperance, temperance, patience. Here we are at patience. Do we stop there? No. Then patience, we add to patience, godliness. That's the God life. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit. And there we've seen of angels, preached to the Gentiles, believed on the world, received up in the glory. 1 Timothy 3.16. Who was manifest in the flesh? Somebody said the Son of God was. No, absolutely not. God was manifest in the flesh. The self-existent eternal spirit of God, Jesus Christ, was manifest in the flesh and revealed his name, Jesus. Jehovah is salvation. My God has become my salvation. Well, I thought he chose a second person of the Godhead. No, he didn't. God's own self, Isaiah 59, 16. He had to have a man, a kinsman redeemer. God looked for a man. He was amazed he could find none. All were conceived in sin, shape and iniquity, none good, no, not one. So what does he do? God looked for a man. He was amazed he could find none. Therefore, his own arm, the arm of flesh, brought salvation to myself, God said. That's Isaiah 59. 59, 16. Take a look at Isaiah 63, 5. States the same thing. He looks for a man. Therefore, my own arm brought salvation to me, God said. God made his own body of flesh and blood. You see that in Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Let this mind be in you. Those are the only ones that's going to be sealed in Revelation 7. That mind be in you. That was also in Christ Jesus. That who, being in the form of God, spirit, morpha, that is an eternal state of being. Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. You can't be equal with God except that you are God because God will share his glory with no one. Well, then what does it mean, thought it not robbery to be equal with God? Something to be grasped upon. Why? Because he is every attribute of God. That spirit is love. The spirit is power. The spirit is wisdom. The spirit is understanding. The spirit is prudence. The spirit is peace. And on and on and on of all the attributes of God. And we find it in uh, Proverbs 8. That wisdom, one of the attributes of God, speaks as a singular personal pronoun. Because it stands on its own. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence. Our wisdom does daily his delight, God's own delight. Well, Jesus is uh, equal with God in every attribute. Thought it not Robert to be equal with God in every attribute. Every attribute God is, Jesus is. His nature revealed God, the fullness of the Godhead in Christ Jesus bodily, Second uh, Colossians uh, uh, 2.9, all of it. In one bodily form, God manifests in the flesh. 1 Timothy 3.16. Well, Philippians 2.6, Jesus, who being in the form of God's spirit, he's always been God, Colossians 1.16 and 17, all things were made by him, whether be the principalities, powers, uh, thrones, uh, things visible, invisible, things seen, unseen, all things were created by Jesus Christ. He is that spirit. Well, He is and always has been the Spirit of God. However, to redeem us, he had to have a man. Isaiah 59, 16, Isaiah 6, 3, 5. He is that man that God chose that man, and it's him. It's not a second person. You'll see that in Isaiah 43, 10, Philippians 2, 6 through 8, right here again. Paul tells us how he did it. He did it in and of himself alone as he said to the church at Corinthian, at Corinth, 2 Corinthians 5, 19. God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. Well, God is Christ. Christ is God. That's the mystery of God and the Father and the Christ. They're one and the same spirit. That's Colossians 2, verse 1 through 9. In whom are hid all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. 
But Jesus said, I won't hide anymore. I'll speak. I will not speak to you anymore in Proverbs. I'm not going to hide it. I'm going to show you plainly of the Father, John 16. I say not when you pray to me I'll, that I will pray the Father for you. Yet you ask in my name. And I'll say not that I'll pray the Father for you. Why? Because he's glorified with the Father's own self. He's gone back to his former glory as the Father. That's that spirit. Now, to save us, he makes himself of no reputation. He empties out of glory. He makes himself void. He puts a self-employed uh, limitation upon himself to take on the form of a servant. The servant is God. As Isaiah 43.10 tells us that. And it says in Philippians 2, 6, it's the Lord God himself. Jesus is the father of glory that took on a body of flesh and blood called the son of God, which is the father revealed. It's a different office. It's not a different person. It's the same spirit, but a different office. The father is the administrative office of the spirit. The word is the expression of the office of the spirit. The Holy Ghost is the power office of the Spirit. The Son of God is a redemption office of the same Spirit. Son of Man is the kingdom office of that Spirit. There's only one Spirit there. One body, one Spirit, in whom you're called and one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God, who's the Father of us all. Who's above all and in us all, the Father. That's Jesus Christ, the Son of God in us, which is the Father of glory, Galatians 4, 6, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son. That's the Spirit of God into our hearts, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Christ is the Father. Christ is the Son. Christ is every office of the Spirit. Now, in the days of His flesh, He made Himself of no reputation. The Holy Ghost, God Himself, the Father of glory, made Himself of no reputation, laid aside His glory. Why? Because he has to have a man. A man lost that only a man can redeem us back. By one man's disobedience, sin came to the world, and death by sin. That's Romans 5. As the offenses of one, so also the free gifts is one. A man lost that only a man can, give, can, can redeem us back. God has to have a man. How does he do it? Well, all the sin comes short of the glory of God. None good, no, not one. So his own arm brings salvation to himself. Isaiah 59, 16. Isaiah 63, 5, and we see that that is what Paul is telling us in the Philippians 2, 6 to 8. Jesus, who being in the form of God, spirit, thought not robbery, be equal to God, every attribute, and made himself of no reputation, not some, none. He's not going to work as spirit. He's going to work as a flesh man, just like you and just like me, made an under law. Galatians 4, verse 4. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, how? Made of a woman, made an under the law. No spirit senior, same to spirit junior, second person, go down and die for the sin of the world. That is a bald-faced lie. Nowhere in the word of God. But Galatians 4, verse 4, how does he send his son? Made of a woman, a virgin birth, made an under the law. Who is he? Emmanuel. Who's born in the city of David? Christ, the Spirit of God, the Lord. Christ, the Spirit, as in 1 Peter 1, verse 10 and 11. All those Old Testament prophets searched search diligently into the grace that should come to us, searching what or what manner of time, the Spirit of Christ that was in him. That Christ is the Spirit of God. When uh, it signified when it testified beforehand of the sufferings of Christ, not Christ Jr. Christ the Spirit is Christ the man. There you have that Christ is the Spirit of God that made himself of no reputation to take on him the form of a servant made in the likeness of man. Philippians 2, 6-8. And being found in fashion as a man. Who? God himself. Not a second person of the Godhead. Not a son of God coming in the flesh, but God himself. You'll see it again in Isaiah 9, 5, and 6. And to us a child is born, and to us a son is given. The government shall rest upon his shoulder, singular. Not shoulders, shoulder, singular. The only thing rested upon Jesus' shoulder was the cross. The cross is the government of God. Crucifying the flesh with affection of the lust, make the count of our salvation perfect through sufferings. Learned obedience through the things which he suffered. 
Now, because Christ has suffered in the flesh, we are arm ourselves with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. We must do the same. We must crucify the flesh with the affection of the lust to be and do the will of God, mortifying the deeds of the flesh. Well, there, after Jesus makes himself of no reputation, he's not working his spirit, he comes under his own law as a man. But Christ the Spirit is Christ the man. He does not cease and desist from being God, the Spirit of God. He just makes himself of no reputation, a self-opposed limitation upon the Spirit, so he can work in under the law to fulfill his own law as a man. Then when he gets through fulfilling the law, being tempted at that point, as we are, yet without sin, Hebrews 4.15, he takes the ordinances of that law and nails it to his cross. And that cross uh, there, until he dies on that cross, that law is still there. That's the reason he has to pray to the Father. Because even though he is the Spirit of God that's made himself with no reputation and took on him the form of a servant, that servant is under the law. That law has not gone away or fulfilled yet until he sheds his blood, breaking down the metal wall of partition, that is to say his veil, that is his flesh, Hebrews 10. That law is still there. There's your key. Because God needed a man to fulfill that law, a perfect, spotless, blameless, sacrifice lamb for, for that sin, and he could find none. All were conceived in sin, shape, and iniquity, none good, no, not one. Therefore, God himself makes himself of no reputation, so he's going to do it himself. That's exactly what he does. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. Well, Christ is God. Yes, Christ was in Christ, reconciling the world to Christ. Or God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, and Christ is God. That's the mystery that is now being revealed, that Jesus stated that. Paul stated that. And the mystery of God and the Father and of Christ, Colossians 2, verse 1 through 9, in whom are hid all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Let no, let no man deceive you by any means. Mankind, the nominal, straight line Christianity, for the most part, has deceived the, the people. Not intentionally, but still, it's either the Word of God or it's not. And that's where we are today. So God, through His judgment, Judgments are in the earth. Men will learn righteousness, and the judgments are coming more with increase, increasingly and with intensity and frequency to get us to turn to God. And he said in Hosea 6, verse 1, Come and let us return to the Lord, for he hath torn. He will heal us. God's doing it himself. He has smitten. He will bind us up. God's doing it to get us to turn to him. And he says, after the second day, I'll revive you. In the third day, I'll raise you up. This is not revival. This is a new thing. This is a new thing that God will do that never has been done before. It's the work of the ministry, judgment to the line, and righteousness to the plummet. To those that are counted worthy, that will come to the measure of the statue of Jesus Christ and to a father's. And they'll turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, children to the, children to the fathers. Lest God says, I'll come and smite the earth with a curse. Malachi 4. God is doing that now. He's sealing his people now to those that have an ear to hear. And the ones that go, ah, oh, no, I'm saved. I'm not going to listen to that. Well, now yeah, they will literally fall by the wayside. They will not be sealed. And any man that's not sealed, looking for a pre-tribulation rapture, whatever the case is, will be tormented by the locust horde in Revelation 9 with the fifth trumpet. And they open the bottom of the spit, the key to the bottom of the spit, and the angel, and the key to the bottom of the spit opens it, and Apollyon and Abaddon. The destroyer comes out with a locust horde that hurt only the men that have not the seal of God in their foreheads. The ones that weren't sealed, they will be tormented for five months, as it was in the days of Noah. Water prevailed upon the earth for 150 days, which is exactly five months, which is the locust horde in Revelation 9 under the fifth trumpet. That's where we're headed. We must be sealed now. Now, how do we know that we can see afar off? How do we know of these things to come? 
How do we have this testimony of Jesus, this spirit of prophecy, to understand the words of the book of this prophecy, which is the revelation of Jesus Christ? How do we know? Well, we'll end this podcast with 2 Peter 1, verse 5, and it states their own that you add to your faith virtue, virtue, knowledge, knowledge, temperance, temperance, patience, patience, godliness, godliness, brotherly kindness, preferring your brother above yourself, condescending men of low estate, bearing one another's burdens, and so fulfilling the law of Christ, and to brotherly kindness, charity. Now, charity is full grown. And Paul states that, that without that charity, we become a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. It comes to vanity. It comes to naught. When I was a child, I speak to the child, understand as a child, Paul stating that, and uh, in abiding faith, hope, and charity, but the greatest is charity. It's full grown. It's that in which that which is perfect is come. Coming to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ is charity in doing the will of God for whatever the purpose and will of God call for each individual member that God will fitly frame it together and compact it according to the measure of each particular member, the measure of each part, the measure of faith that God has dealt to each man, the measure of faith, which must be the individual will and purpose of God carried out in each individual believer of whichever joint supplies to the edifying of itself in love. Growing up into Jesus in all things and all truth, this body will come into all truth in the last days before the rapture, before the second advent of our Lord Jesus Christ. He'll present to him a glorious church without spot, without blemish, perfect in all her ways. The bride has made herself ready. Well, charity will cover up is will cover a multitude of sins. Charity is the bond or guarantee of perfectness. Charity must be reached unto perfection. And it goes on and states what it means. If these things be in you, and that is faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, godliness, brotherly kindness, brotherly kindness, charity, if all these things be in you and abound, it must abound, then what does it do? It makes you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Save through the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, through these sealed great and precious promises, whereby we're made protectors of his divine nature. But he that lacketh these things, we lack faith, we lack virtue, we lack knowledge. Many people not seeking God don't have the knowledge. Temperance, lack the patience, lack Godliness, the God life, lack brotherly kindness, and especially lack charity, which is the final epoch in the growth stage in glory from, from glory to glory, and it's by the Spirit of the Lord coming to the same image of Jesus. Most do not preach that. They think it's unattainable, and it's only attainable through the Spirit of God, not us, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's by the grace of God through faith. But it has to be obeyed, the obedience unto righteousness. He that lacketh these things is blind, cannot see afar off. They can't understand the work of God, can't understand what they're called for. Calling, and it said, therefore, to see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. It becomes a mechanical worship. And that is what happened with the Ephesus. You know, become mechanical. You've left your first love, the church at Ephesus. Or, as in Laodicea, you're increased with goods. You think that God is one that is going to prosper to you in mammon. It's all mammon. It's all money, focused on money. You think you're clothed, fed, and have need of nothing. Jesus said, knowest thou not, you're poor, wretched, naked, and destitute. Not a good report to the Lord. And it says, I counsel thee to buy me gold tried in the fire, chastening the rod of God. Then he goes on and says here, if you do these things, we must do these things. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Make sure that you're right with God and doing the will of God, working out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it's God that worketh in you, both the will and do of his good pleasure, not of us, 
Not what we want, but what he wants. His calling, his purpose in our life. For if you do these things, you shall never fail. That's the reason charity is so important. And you have grown up into Jesus in all things that you're not tossed to and fro by every one of doctrine. And you have the assurance that through your sailing that you will never fail. These things have to be not only in you, but abound. And that's what God is doing now. Well, if this has uh, uh, been a witness to you through the Holy Ghost, bearing witness with you, your spirit, then please contact me where we can work together. We're called, therefore, bringing and preaching this gospel to every creature, to all the world, for a witness unto all nations. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth and not shall be damned. We need to hear from you. You can simply email me, sealinggodspeople at dennisbeard.org. Or you can write to me, Post Office Box 2906, Longview, Texas, zip code 75606. If you like the books, one of the seven books that was authored, uh, four are on the Godhead explaining how God is one and answer a lot of your questions. What the mark of the beast is, the keys of stigma, 603 score and 6. You can... Uh, you can access these books and ebooks at dennisbeard.org. There you can also reach us at sealinggodspeople.org, sealinggodspeople.com. If you'd like to have fellowship with us, and maybe you're in another country, another nation, you can do so at jcic.tv. And that's where we have uh, to the Tabernacle is the newsletter. We keep you up to current events and dates and what we're doing in the ministry there and also have Q&A question and answers with you. And your comments also are greatly appreciated. And that's where we do it, jcic.tv at that website. Also, download our app and for our daily podcast on Sealing God's People for focusing on the present truth of the Word of God and the preceding Word of God in the sealing of God's people that He's doing now. This is what God is doing, getting us ready for this last day work of the ministry. Let's don't miss out. I look forward to hearing from you. Well, we pray that God will perfect that which is lacking in each one of us, that we all may be presented blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in both spirit, soul, and body. Until the next time, this is Brother Dennis Spirit saying, Behold, the real Jesus. And yes, brethren, we're in the last of the last days. All know that. All that studied any eschatology at all know that. But where are we as far as the body of Christ coming together in the true revelation of Jesus Christ, which is the last book in the Word of God? The revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, sent and signified it by his angel unto John. We, the body of Christ, have to come together. Those of you that know the voice of God, you know the voice and are led by the Spirit of God, you are the sons of God. You are the ones that God has called for this last day work of the ministry. That last day work of the ministry is through the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, for this gospel to be preached in all the world for witness unto all nations. For us to come together is critical. I want you to contact me. We need to work together. We've had more downloads on Feeling God's People on our daily podcast than ever before. We know that there are the listeners that know the Spirit of God. You're led of the Holy Ghost. You are the sons of God and God dealing with all of us to come together as one. So I put it before you. Contact me. We have several different contacts there on uh, social media. Of course, the daily podcast, Sealing God's People, there, simply download the app, tune in daily, as many of you are doing, up in the thousands down. We thank God for you. We need to move. We need to come together. There, you can email me at sealinggodspeople at 
dennisbeard.org. Again, my email address, sailinggodspeople at dennisbeard.org. You can also help send this gospel for the Jesus-only training centers throughout the world where the ministers are crying out for it. They're at dennisbeard.org, our website there, promoting our e-books. There are seven e-books there, and four of them do with the Godhead uh, that God is moving uh, many out of the false doctrine of Trinity into the true revelation of Jesus Christ, the true God and eternal life, Jesus, the omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent spirit of God, Jesus' only doctrine of Christ. We have four books on the Godhead. Behold the real Jesus, Christ, the revelation of the Son of God, Hear, O Israel, and uh, the eras of the Trinity. These four go into detail about how God works salvation in and of himself. Our God, Jehovah, is our salvation, Jesus. Also, why it is so essential for the soul out in the last days, uh, selling out and why the word of God in the constitution of the kingdom of heaven commands us to sell out. That is uh, an essential for the true Christian. There we also have the great deception, the 603 score and six, the keys of stigma, exactly what it is, and the manifested sons of God, the true doctrine of the manifested sons of God, which that has been watered uh, down through the 1940s and 50s, saying that it was some great person that was going to lead the body of Christ instead of a body ministry. The work of the ministry is the church of the living God coming together in the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God uh, unto a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. There, Dennis Beard, we have received uh, a visitation from our Lord Jesus Christ on the 19th of January, 2019. Many of you have heard that already. While in trans Kenya, Africa, saying, Seal my people by my word, even as I send by angel ascending from the east, having this seal of the living God, so send I you. Now, this is not for any of our righteousness or our holiness that the Lord spoke this to me. It is the body of Christ coming together in the unity of the faith. And well, it's a call there for the body of Christ to come into one mind and one accord now. Please contact me. Some of you are not called, uh, all are called for first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, gifts of miracles, gifts of healings, uh, governments, helps, but all, each individual member of the body of Christ has a specific call for us to do for the body of Christ uh, to fulfill the will of God in these last days with the gospel of the kingdom being preached into all the world for a witness unto all nations. So we implore you, please contact me so we can uh, meet where we can work together. Africa is crying out. We have over a thousand ministers in Africa that have left the false trinity doctrine into the true doctrine of Christ. Not only that, but India, Nepal, Pakistan, Philippines, uh, New Zealand, it's on and on that the ministers are crying out, we need your help. They're asking for the Jesus only training centers to be placed in their nations. We feel the call to do that, but we can't do it alone. It takes us, the body of Christ coming together. And God will literally put it together and uh, then compact it, of whichever joint supplies to the edifying of a seven love the body of Christ will come together. And as the Lord has dealt with you individually, and you know the voice of the Son of God, you know the Holy Ghost, you know that there is more in the body of Christ for us to do in the will of God, then please contact me. The information is on your screen. There, DennisBeard.org is our site, website. We also have sealinggodspeople.org, sealinggodspeople.com. For those of you that would like to get our daily uh, ministry, uh, I get notices there what we're doing. 
you can go to jcic.tv. That's Jesus Christ International Church.tv, the abbreviated jcic.tv. Join up with us, and I will write to you individually on that website. It's made for the ministers worldwide. There, you simply uh, join up uh, where you're from, and uh, then you will get notices. And the daily podcast, as well as the streaming, and these uh, broadcasts will be uploaded for you there, as well as questions and answers, as well as blogs. We need to come together again. Contact me. You can also write me. That is DBM, Dennis Beard Ministries, Post Office Box 2906, Longview, Texas, zip code 75606. Don't procrastinate. You that know the voice of the Son of God, you know the Holy Ghost leading. Don't procrastinate. Do it now, and I'll look forward to meeting you. Till the next time, this is Brother Dennis Beard saying, Behold, the real Jesus.